So good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to this edition of the NITEX Colloquium. Uh, my name is Francesco uh, Petruccione, and today I have the pleasure of introducing Professor, and I hope I pronounce it right, Özlem uh, Bishop, yeah, from the University, from the Rhodes, uh, from the from Rhodes uh, University. Yeah. Um, a quick, a brief um, introduction to the to the speaker. Uh, Professor Bishop studied in in Turkey, where I think she's originally uh, from, and and she studied <clears throat> molecular biology. Uh, at the university in, uh, in Istanbul. Uh, later, she uh, moved to, to Berlin in Germany for her PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics and at the Free uh, University in, in, in Berlin. <clears throat> and that's where she became interested in, in, in structural bi biology, which she also pursued in her postdoc position uh, at the Texas University and, uh, and at other uh, university following that. Yeah. Uh, in 2009, uh, she moved to, to Rhodes, where she's been uh, since then, <clears throat> uh, I assume, and she established the research unit in, uh, in bioinformatics there in 2013. She's also been uh, uh, very instrumental for the development of bioinformatics in, in the country because uh, she was the first, uh, the co-founder and the first president of the South Africa Society for Bioinformatics, uh, SASP, uh, from 2012 to 2010. And 14, and, and she's also a mentor for the SASB uh, Student uh, Society. And uh, uh, she has a very long list of fellowships and, and awards that, <laughs> that I would not read you out, read you out here. Yeah. So, Professor Bishop, we are really very happy uh, that you are with us uh, this afternoon. And um, <clears throat> sorry, I don't have to ask you to share the screen because you've already done that. Thank you very much for that. But before I ask you to start with your presentation, I will quickly remind the, 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 the participants <clears throat> that uh, to make use of the Q&A facility at, at the bottom of the, of the Zoom screen to ask questions. And uh, Professor Sinaiski, who always uh, kindly volunteers to moderate the Q&A uh, session, will then uh, um, forward the, the questions to, to, to Professor Bishop. Yeah? Also, at the end of the talk, as, uh, as in the past, our usual virtual social tradition, uh, we want to meet in, in Kumo space uh, for a brief uh, social uh, interaction in a less uh, formal uh, environment. So please join us there if you, if you have time and if you want to uh, chat uh, with, with Professor Bishop after the talk. Yeah, Professor Bishop, thank you very much. We are really happy uh, to, to, to have you with us this afternoon and we are very keen to learn the latest about computational drug discovery. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank, thank you very much, Francesco, uh, for a kind introduction. And before starting, I also would like to thank uh, organizers for giving me this opportunity to present some of our work here in this uh, colloquium. Okay, the talk will be divided into three parts, uh, considering that a number of uh, the, um, uh, the audience might be uh, not familiar with the drug discovery. I would like to first uh, give some basic uh, introductory concepts and terminology, and uh, then we'll continue with the examples uh, from our research projects. Last week, we listened to a very uh, informative talk uh, on computational drug discovery and development from Dr. Samuel from UWC. And this talk uh, aims to build on top of that uh, with some additional uh, concept in early computational drug discovery. So the second part will be about identification of allosteric modulators. A specific examples will be given uh, from cancer research. And the third part uh, will be a building on top of a uh, part two, and we will be discussing how mutations uh, uh, would affect um, allosteric modulators, hence the importance uh, of uh, considering them in early drug discovery. And the case that they will be uh, given from SARS-CoV-2 and proprotein. Okay, let me start with um, the basic introduction, introducing some basic concepts. Uh, 
Um, as we all know, drug research and development is a highly complex and multidisciplinary uh, process. It can perhaps broadly be divided into two stages, discovery and development. And discovery stage is highly crucial because um, it feeds to the uh, preclinical and uh, clinical studies, which are extremely expensive. Um, discovery stage can be uh, further divided into perhaps four uh, steps, uh, stages, and these are the target discovery, heat generation, lead identification, and lead optimization. So now computational drug discovery has a very important role in discovery stage uh, um, of the drug research and development and can take place in every step of, uh, of these uh, things, starting from uh, target discovery to lead optimization. But uh, I think the, the, the key role of computational biology uh, lies uh, in these two stages, a heat identification and lead uh, identification. So basically, uh, these uh, two steps can be achieved by a large-scale compound screening and molecular dynamics uh, simulations. And of course, whatever we get uh, here should be um, complemented, supported with the wet lab experiments to be able to take the further steps. Okay, so um, given the complexity of the drug discovery and development, the field has its own uh, challenges as well as its successes. It is unfortunately uh, not uncommon to uh, stop a drug development in clinical uh, phases, especially in phase three. But actually challenges go beyond the drug development stages and include those that develop once a drug is marketed. According to a recent study published in 2020, a total of 133 uh, drugs were withdrawn from the market um, due to safety reasons. And we look at the reasons behind that, um, roughly 50% is due to some sort of toxicity, hepatoxicity or nephrotoxicity. So toxicity is one of the problems in drug development. Um, I will come back to uh, this with some uh, proposed solutions. Okay, so what is the um, reasons behind such a high attrition rate? Basically, it is reported as a bad experimental design starting from uh, the beginning. So early drug discovery stages are highly important and the solution is uh, simple. It's hard to, it's easy to say, hard to apply, but the solution is basically applying comprehensive, well-considered criteria to each uh, step starting from the early drug discovery stages. So it is, uh, it's hard to apply because as I indicated, drug discovery, even in early stages is multidisciplinary. It, it has many uh, sub steps uh, to be uh, achieved. Um, but still, one can try to reduce the attrition, high attrition rate uh, with certain introducing certain concepts. And today I would like to talk about two of them. And these are the allosteric and mutations, which are highly underutilized concepts in the computational, early computational drug discovery. So there are two types of uh, drugs, FDA-approved drugs. These are the orthosteric drugs and allosteric drugs. So what is orthosteric? What is allosteric? Let's look at that first. Orthosteric uh, site is basically the functional side of a protein. So protein can be an enzyme, and then the functional site would be the active site. As you can see here in the figure, the active site has two uh, sections actually. 
a mostly binding site where the substrate or drug uh, binds, uh, nicely binds, and the small uh, bit of the active site uh, forms the catalytic site where the chemical reaction occurs. Okay, so if the protein is not an enzyme, and uh, if it's a receptor, then the orthosteric site is basically protein-protein binding site. Okay, so it means that uh, then also orthosteric drugs are the drugs binding the or orthosteric site. So these uh, drugs bind to the functional site of a protein, compete with endogenous regulators and block the activity directly. Okay, so simple enough. So it binds and blocks the activity. So what is allosteric? Uh, the term uh, actually was originated from two Greek words, allos meaning other, alternate, and stereo meaning uh, solid shapes. So allosteric sites are uh, the sites away from the active site. So they are uh, they can be far from the uh, active site, but the perturbations uh, to these sites uh, would affect the structure and function of the active site. So there is basically a sort of communication between the allosteric site and the active site in a protein. And this communication is called allosteric communication. So then the allosteric drugs is the ones binding to active site, uh, allosteric site, sorry, and they do not bind the active site, but still affect the function of the active site by a, some sort of communication, by changing the, the shape uh, or the conformation, conformation or function of the active site. So um, for perturbation, uh, there are different ways of uh, perturbing a uh, allosteric site, and these are generally called effectors. And an effector can be a post-translational modification. So for instance, phosphorylation of a residue uh, can uh, cause uh, perhaps a change in the behavior of the active site. It can be a ligand, an allosteric drug. It can be DNA or RNA binding, or it can be simply a mutation. So we know that uh, orthosteric drugs, um, in the presence of uh, orthosteric drugs, pathogens introduces uh, mutations. And these mutations can be far from the active site. They can be, for instance, uh, near to allosteric site. And these mutations then can affect the function of the orthosteric drug. And these mutations are called allosteric mutations. OK, let's go back to uh, FDA-approved drugs. So there are currently 3,700 FDA-approved drugs. And only 19 of them are allosteric. Uh, and there's a huge difference, num number different difference between these two, uh, two type of drugs, right? I mean, 19 versus 3,680 roughly orthosteric drugs. And this uh, hints us the difficulty of designing orthosteric drugs. The term allosteric, difficult of allosteric drugs, apologies for that. So the term of allosteric was introduced roughly 60 in 1960, 60 years ago. And the first allosteric drug was approved by FDA in 2004. So the progress of uh, finding and developing allosteric drugs uh, is uh, very slow. It is, yes, it is due to difficulty of designing, but it is also not a very commonly uh, taught. I mean, basically drug discovery uh, mostly goes to, the most of the effort goes to allosteric uh, or drugs. 
So why it is difficult to design allosteric uh, drugs? First of all, it is hard to identify allosteric uh, sites. At least it was uh, hard to identify allosteric uh, sites some, uh, some time ago, and it was defined as serendipity. And most of the allosteric sites found was by chance. Um, but this, it has been changing due to the development, uh, especially in the NMR technologies. So allosteric sites can be shallow. It cannot uh, perhaps uh, be identified. So a protein uh, can have many uh, different pockets and would have many different pockets if you look at the protein but not every pocket is allosteric. So not every, a, every pocket would affect, uh, if something binds to that pocket, affect uh, the active site. So that's why it is hard to identify uh, the uh, allosteric sites. And uh, when you identify them uh, further, you need to be able to demonstrate that uh, the, whatever is binding, uh, to that pocket is really affecting the, the active site. Also, there are cryptic pockets. These are not easily detectable. They come out in certain, uh, certain under certain conditions. So if you look at the crystal structure uh, of a protein, uh, sometimes you miss these uh, cryptic pockets. They are actually identified with serendipity. So I would like to take you to one of our recent uh, studies. Uh, here we were looking at a um, malarial drug target, falsipain 2. We identified a uh, six pockets. So this uh, protein has six pockets is indicated in different colors here. And, uh, and these are the evolutionary uh, mutations. The red ones are the drug resistant related mutations. And this is the active site here. So what we observed here uh, is actually in the presence of one of the mutations, this mutation here, these two pockets, pocket six and pocket two, are uh, becoming uh, together. Uh, uh, it's uh, becoming a cryptic pocket. If you watch that, you will see that it's, it opens now, two pockets becomes one pocket and some, uh, and we identify cryptic pockets. So this is basically uh, only uh, we could identify this uh, cryptic pocket, which is in the presence of mutations, you don't see it in the wild type uh, over the MD simulations by careful uh, examination, by chance, basically. Okay, so uh, yes, it is difficult to identify allosteric sites and develop allosteric drugs, but allosteric drugs have uh, many uh, benefits over orthosteric drugs. First of all, allosteric sites are less conserved compared to active sites. And therefore, allosteric modulators are highly specific, hence may be less toxic to a uh, host. So let me explain this a bit uh, more with, uh, with this diagram. So let's say we want to design, um, we are looking at a malarial parasite uh, protein as a drug target. And let's say that uh, this one, this protein might have a human homologs. And if there is human homologs, the active site area uh, between the homolog proteins are highly conserved. So there would be only slight changes between the human homologs and the malarial protein. So if uh, we design orthosteric drugs for this uh, malarial protein, it has to be fine-tuned uh, not to bind to the human one. But if this is not achieved and this is highly difficult, then uh, basically uh, the drug uh, targeting the malarial protein uh, can also bind to human one and cause the toxicity. 
Okay, so specificity is highly important, but it is hard, a highly difficult sometimes to achieve in orthostatic drugs, hence they cause the toxicity. On the other hand, if we have a, if we want to design allostics, a modulator allostic drug, which would be much easier uh, because uh, allostatic sites are not uh, conserved, they are different. So the allostatic drug uh, binding to malaria protein most likely wouldn't bind to the human protein. Okay, so the second benefit is uh, orthostatic drugs uh, compete with substrate and cofactors. Okay, on the other hand, allosteric drugs uh, doesn't bind to active site uh, and work perfectly well in the presence of the native substrates. Um, in, in the pressure, drug pressure, uh, pathogens actually can develop resistance by increasing the concentration of the substrate or introducing the mutations. And this is a, a less likely in, in the allosteric drugs. So let's look at again this diagram. So what happens uh, if we have orthosteric drug pathogen produces, can produce a high concentration of endogenous substrate, which would compete with drug and would uh, bind to the active site or it could introduce a mutation uh, in, in the active site area where it allows to bind the substrate, endogenous substrate, but not drug, or somewhere else in the protein. On the other hand, allosteric uh, protein, allosteric modulators uh, basically uh, would bind to allosteric sites and by this way change the, um, the shape of the active site uh, in a way that substrate wouldn't be able to bind no matter in what concentration it is. So these are the two important aspects of the allosteric sites. Now the resistance I mentioned about pathogen sometimes uh, introduce mutations to uh, to uh, dislocate or get rid of the drug from the active site. So this brings us uh, the concept of mutations. So there are num different uh, mutations. Um, our interest is here, missense mutations. These mutations are uh, the ones that we observe in the proteins and uh, these uh, nucleotide mutations cause basically the amino acid change in the protein. Okay, so I would like to give one example from one of our uh, studies in drug resistance. Uh, here you see the HIV proteins. There are a number of drugs uh, targeting HIV uh, proteins, and this is uh, where the active site is. What I'm showing here, these dots, red dots, are the, the mutations that are uh, introduced in, in the HIV proteins by time, uh, is, and they can be either drug resistant or drug knife uh, mutations. Okay, so what we did, um, as you can see, the mutations are all around. They are not only the active site, but they cause a drug resistance. What we did here, we uh, analyzed uh, uh, in a way uh, to see if there is a common mechanism against all these uh, protease drugs. And we identified that there is a kind of and they, regardless of the drug, these mutations, drug resistance mutations compared to drug naive mutations are causing a kind of a lateral expansion in the protein and a push from the bottom part of the, the protein. So in a way, with this uh, allosteric uh, effect, they are, uh, we um, speculate a hypothesis that uh, this uh, kind of uh, movement would dislocate the, the drug and this is how they get resistance. 
Okay, the other similar study we applied to uh, applied to the PISA day. This is a first uh, line a TB drug, and uh, the, the protein is PISA days. And as you can see, again mutations are or resistance mutations are all around the protein, not specifically in the active site. Uh, we looked at 83 mutations and they occur all around the world. And we uh, again identified that in the presence of some of the mutations, a uh, drug uh, prematurely uh, coming out of the, the protein. And this is again due to a common mechanism, a kind of lid opening mechanism. Some of the mutations um, are uh, basically causing an allosteric effect of the, the opening of the lid and hence the releasing the drug prematurely. Okay, so how do you how do we do these analyses? Uh, basically, the whole study started in 2017 uh, when we wanted to look at a missense a effect of missense mutations in proteins. That time we uh, we realized that there was not much uh, done in the field. We put a pipeline together uh, with my PhD student that time with David, and we also proposed something called dynamic residue networks. So, um, and we made a tool uh, out of that uh, to look at the, how the residues are basically communicating with, uh, within the protein. Uh, over the MD simulations and how this uh, communication is changing in the presence of mutations. But soon after, we also realized that actually this is a very good approach to identify the allosteric sites and allosteric communication pathways, not only for the mutations. But on the other hand, uh, as I uh, hinted to you, there is a link between uh, mutations and allosteric uh, most of the time. Okay, so uh, residue networks were not uh, new. It was known but at that time, but it was mostly done for the static structures. So what we proposed is to carry these uh, calculations over the molecular dynamic simulations, by this way to reduce the, the structure dependent uh, errors and inconsistency, inconsistency in the in the results. So now we what we do here is to identify key residues. They are called uh, central cent central residues. Okay, so central residues are functionally important residues. And there are a number of ways of uh, calculating uh, these central residues. And the concept is coming from social sciences. Okay, so basically network analysis first uh, was applied in social sciences before it come to the biology. And one of the major network analysis concept is six degrees of separation. And the idea uh, here um, that people who seem very unlike uh, one another may be uh, connected by a chance of six or fewer mutual acquaintances. Okay, so this uh, concept also is carried to social media, such as Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon game, where the goal of the game is to uh, connect any actor to Kevin Bacon through uh, co-stars in movies in as a few steps as possible. Okay, so now what we are doing here, we are uh, imagining that this is the active site area and these uh, people actors are the residues and we are looking at how these residues are connected to each other over the MD simulations and what happens when you introduce a mutation uh, or uh, in the presence of an allosteric uh, modulator, how these uh, connections change and then we are basically comparing them. 
So the whole methodology is calculating the networks and there are uh, many different ways of calculating many different metrics, uh, looking at different uh, communication networks and they are named here. And these and from these networks, we are calculating the, the key residues uh, with their values, converting them into heat maps and then mapping them to the structures. What we are mapping is mostly comparative values between like wild type and the mutant or a protein without a ligand and protein with ligands. So how the, how the network is changing in presence of any effect. And one example is here in the presence of this mutation, we observe a kind of communication path to the, the active site from the allosteric mutation. And this path is not exist in the presence of, uh, in the absence of that mutation. Okay, so now I would like to uh, give some examples from allosteric modulators that we identified. This ever was done by two uh, previous PhD students, David and David Penkler and. Arnold Amusangeri, um, HSP90, he showed protein 90, is a very popular cancer drug target. But unfortunately, even though there is lots of work done to this protein, uh, not, there is not a drug and that's due to toxicity. And uh, as I explained, toxicity is coming from a non-specific uh, orthosteric drug. So our target uh, was to identify uh, to identify to find allosteric drugs. Can we find allosteric drugs here? So uh, this protein has highly complicated life cycle. I'm not gonna enter, but it opens and closes and is functional when it's closes and when there are some ATPs uh, bound and and the function stops when it's a, a if the protein a opens. Okay, so it is it's a it's a circle a circle a, with number of additional parameters. Okay, so what we did, we identified allosteric uh, regions, um, hotspot residues by using MD simulations and network analysis and another uh, method that I'm not gonna talk here. And from there, we wanted to look at actually a C terminal domain and potential allosteric site there. Uh, and it's some uh, docking. And for docking, we use South African natural compounds. And there is a database which is freely available in, in this uh, URL. Okay, so what we found actually, we, uh, there are two potential allosteric pockets. Uh, we screened over 600 compounds and identified that two of them was binding to one pocket and the other one was binding to another pocket. As a control, we use novobiosin. Uh, novobiosin is known to bind the C-terminal domain, uh, not exactly where, but it is known that it's binding there. It is allosteric, it's non-allosteric inhibitor, and it is also known that it is destabilizing the heat shock protein 90 a dimer by opening it. So our control uh, um, uh, work very nicely. And we also identified that two or out of three uh, natural compounds that we found uh, would uh, lead to similar behavior in the protein. So I'm gonna show you uh, one uh, movie which shows um, and the behavior of, um, sorry, behavior of Hishro protein in the presence of novobiosin, as you can see, 
the di dimer is opening and dissociating and the similar behavior we identified in one of the South African natural compounds. Okay, so uh, the, the next study was again, a, we looked at uh, South African uh, compounds and in this case, a heat shock protein 70, another cancer drug target. We identified an allosteric potential allosteric pocket, which was also reported by another group a few years back. And what we found that in the normal case, this protein just uh, uh, freely flips around, but in the presence of uh, this allosteric modulator, it basically locks each other and the domains don't uh, come uh, uh, open again. So we did this very long uh, simulations. We never managed to dissociate these two domains. And most interestingly, also it locks the ADP dissociation, which you see it in native protein. So that is also a functionally important ADP has to dissociate from the protein. So these two uh, together think us uh, that this uh, compound uh, is a potential uh, inhibitor for HSP90 uh, and good uh, modulator for cancer uh, studies. So um, in the next, uh, I think I have 10 more minutes, 10 minutes I will uh, give a example from uh, SARS-CoV-2 and proprotein, what happens to allosteric modulator in the presence of mutations. So our, uh, this study is published in these two uh, articles, consecutive articles. Uh, so here, uh, well, I'm pretty sure you all are aware that AMPRO is one of the, the main drug targets for COVID. Um, and the good thing with that there is no homolog in the human, so it is really a good drug target. It has two uh, uh, monomers, so it's functional as dimer and it has number uh, three uh, functional uh, domains that I'm not gonna enter uh, so much details. So uh, our aim in this uh, study uh, was to understand how the behavior of active site as well as a uh, potential allosteric site changes in the presence of the selected mutations. We all know that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is continuously uh, evolving uh, and new uh, strains are coming. Uh, and the last one is Omicron. And we identified actually four uh, mutations of Omicron in this uh, protein. Okay, so uh, the first step here uh, was the identification of mutations. Uh, this study was done last year in April. Uh, so that's why uh, uh, some of the mutations uh, disappear. Some of them are still there. But the interesting thing, this was one of the first studies actually showing the effect of mutations uh, in this protein. Okay, we identified uh, 50 distinct mutant sequences, and as you can see, mutations are again all around the protein. Okay, it's never specifically targeting like the active site area, but they are always all around the protein, but they can affect the, the function from the from the distance as we discussed earlier. So uh, we did a number of uh, things here. Our aim was to understand if uh, any of these mutations are affecting the structure of the protein. Okay, so the, the general approach here is we model the protein with the mutations and put into MD simulations, molecular dynamic simulations, 
and then check the uh, root mean square deviation with respect to the first uh, frame of the structure. Okay, so uh, this is the, our reference structure. As you can see, it's nicely uh, sitting, it's intact, but in some of the cases, we observe that the protein structure has uh, two conformations and uh, different than the reference structure. So one single mutation uh, was uh, causing, uh, in some cases, uh, quite a bit of conformation changes. Okay, the, another example that I want to share with you here is the, um, we looked at the interprotomer uh, distances between uh, two monomers. As I said, this protein uh, has two of the same. Uh, it's a dimer uh, and it's functional only as a dimer because active site is uh, actually between uh, yeah, kind of in the dimer, in the uh, dimer interface is extremely important for the function of the protein. So this is again our reference uh, protein, and these are the, the, the proteins in the presence of uh, mutations. And in some cases, you can see that dimer is a highly, the center of mass distance between two protomers uh, are highly different than the, the reference protein. So uh, then next, uh, we looked at for the allosteric sites, uh, we identified an allosteric site uh, between a, between a, near to the end of the one monomer in near to interface opposite to active site. Perhaps it's hard to explain here, but uh, we identified basically two allosteric pockets because this is a dimer and, a, and with the two active sites, two allosteric uh, pockets. Okay, this protein has two active sites, two allosteric pockets. So what was really interesting is uh, that we looked at the pocket, uh, uh, active side pocket and allosteric side pocket, how these two uh, active, active side pockets and how these two allosteric pockets are uh, behaving in the presence of mutations. And blue shows one pocket, the, um, the orange shows the other pocket, uh, of the active site in this new case. Uh, and as you can see, in some cases, these pockets are behaving differently from each other. And we saw uh, more of those difference in the allosteric pockets. Okay, so even though uh, we have two pockets, these pockets have a different behavior in the same protein in the presence of the mutations. And they were almost like doing a kind of breathing uh, movement, but it is hard to uh, show uh, that uh, that is the case. So, and there is definitely, there was a definitely interaction between the allosteric pocket movement and the active site uh, pocket. So as a third step, then we identified, we again screened against uh, South African natural compounds. We identified six potential compounds, nicely binding to the reference protein. And then of course, our question was, what, what would happen to this nicely binding uh, ligands in the presence of the mutations? And each box shows uh, the ligand uh, and in the presence of different mutations. And this is a lig plot. And if you see something like that, it means that ligand is stable. And if you see something really distorted and long, it means that ligand is not stable. And what was very surprising, uh, the, the behavior, the effect of mutations was basically ligand dependent. Uh, for instance, here, this ligand and this ligand was perfectly fine in most of the uh, mutations, 
but this ligand was a highly becoming highly unstable in the presence of mutations. So now most of the time when you do computational uh, drug discovery research, you uh, use you screen the compounds to wild type and it ends there. So then from there, you if you have really good hit, you start to do ligand uh, lead development, but it is actually highly crucial to look at uh, the behavior of that uh, potential hit in the presence of the mutations because you might get totally different uh, view as you can see here with this uh, compound. Okay, so basically there were only uh, three uh, um, modulators, allosteric modulators, uh, um, uh, we stayed stable, uh, no, sorry, uh, there were only three uh, mutants uh, where they accommodated the six allosteric modulators nicely and stably. And the, in the rest of the systems, uh, mutations cause uh, the instability in these uh, ligands. So as a next, we wanted to see, we, we observed that there was allosteric communication between these uh, compounds and the active site. And what we wanted to see is how this allosteric communication uh, was uh, getting affected in the presence of mutations or if they were getting affected. So again, as I said, we calculated our networks, converted into heat maps with the values here. And then this is the wild type reference protein in the presence of the mutations and the rest in the presence of the ligand, this ligand, highly unstable one, and in this case, highly stable. And you can see even from this heat map that there are these, there are many cases very different from the the reference proteins behavior. Okay, so, so as I indicated before, that information that we are getting from these heat maps uh, uh, was mapped into the structure to see what is going on. So what you are seeing here, this is the wild type protein in the presence of ligand three. O2, which is highly unstable in many uh, mutants. Uh, as you can see, there is a communication path from ligand to the active site here. And that communication path is uh, mostly lost, uh, diminished in the presence of one of the mutations. This is one of the examples. Okay, so uh, and uh, there are many, many cases like that if we go through each of these mutations. And on the other hand, this uh, protein, uh, this ligand was highly stable in most of the mutations, but there were cases where uh, we again saw the loss of the allosteric communication. So with that I would like to again emphasize that it is highly important to consider the, the, the mutation knowledge uh, while designing the inhibitors because you might be getting perfectly good allosteric uh, communication part or allosteric effect for, uh, in the wild type but uh, pathogens uh, evolve and we have many examples, including the COVID uh, currently. And it, is, uh, it would be more advisable to design uh, actually drugs in the consideration of these evolutionary mutations. With that, I would like to finish uh, and acknowledge all the, all the um, uh, funders without their support, uh, this uh, work uh, wouldn't uh, happen. And also I would like to acknowledge my uh, group. This was the last uh, <laughs> physical photo that we had all together in 2019. 
Uh, many of these students are currently uh, finishing and graduating or already graduated and left the group. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Bishop, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, Ilya, do we have questions from the audience <clears throat> in the Q&A? Uh, no, we, we get just on the compliments and the people are asking about recording. Yes, recording will be available after the video is processed, probably later today, or in the worst case scenario, tomorrow by the evening, it will be definitely in the NITEX YouTube channel. Thank you, Ilya, for that. And, and maybe since we are not so many um, participants that have questions, are welcome to raise their hand and, and you know, give them the, the, the right uh, to speak in person. Yeah? Um, but maybe while people think about questions, can I ask you something? Um, sure. um, all your uh, uh, simulations, they are all classical. There is no quantum effect no. In explicitly considered. Yeah? Uh, no, no, uh, they are all atom molecular dynamic simulations. Yes. Yeah, 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 and yeah. sometimes I get this uh, emails from CHPC like you use like three million CPU times. What are you doing online? <laughs> so yeah, yeah <laughs> lots of okay. lots of MD simulations. Okay, okay. And and do you think in in, in this uh, drug discovery business is is there a potential for for quantum effects or for 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 proper quantum simulations to add some value of sorts. Actually, this is currently uh, something people are not thinking uh, yet. And I don't know how much I should make it public. But I actually started to talk to uh, one of my chemistry a colleague to look at from that, that perspective. Yes, we, we do uh, sometimes look at uh, the quantum mechanics. It, I'm not a uh, really expert or familiar with that, but I know that my uh, chemistry colleague does that, but there is lots of applications actually uh, could be uh, included to look at in more detail how the electron transfers uh, and all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 how important is the is the precision with which, for instance, bind, binding ed energies are calculated? Uh, does this affect the, the, the um, I don't know the, the properties of your uh, of your uh, yeah of, of your new drugs? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I mean. Basically, when we do docking uh, and when uh, people do docking, they look at the binding energies, yes, yes, yes. which is not really uh, highly accurate um, because it depends on the, and that's the problem. Um, uh, it depends on the size of the ligand. If we are working with really big ligands. Sometimes you get really good binding energy, but sometimes with small one like this SARS-CoV-2, you don't get a very a good uh, negative energy. And that's, that's relative and that's a bit misleading. So yeah. uh, that's why one needs to look at other things. Uh, and we try to look at the other things like the clustering uh, and the position and all sorts of things, yeah. Okay, okay interesting. So, so, so things like uh, density functional theory simulation and things like that don't play a crucial role in this business. Mm. I, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, think, I have I, no idea. I'm just I curious. Think it would be. It is very interesting. Uh, I would. I would really love to talk uh, people uh, working in more quantum mechanics and electron transfer and all these things because actually, it it's the, there is separation in the field. So it's it, there is so much to do. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean. Yeah and would probably improve the accuracy and how you are looking at the things. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, very interesting, very interesting. Maybe, you know, we are, uh, I believe we, I mean, I'm, myself and my group, we are quantum people, so, so it would be very yeah, funny. Perhaps we should, we should talk more about... Uh, yeah, no, that could be interesting. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Could be very interesting. Yeah. 
Okay, I see there is a comment in the chat, Ilya. Is that a question? Yes, it's a question ah, yeah. in the chat. And the question is uh, from Bright Okoko, and it's wonderful presentation. Thank you. Is there any correlation between allosteric size determinants and drug e efficacy? Well, what do you mean allosteric side determinants? Um, well, I, as I indicated, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we, can, we can give a bright, I just, ah, here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Ilya. Maybe he can explain to us in person, yeah. Sorry, bright, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. And explain what you mean. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I can say that, yeah, I mean, because there are a handful of allosteric drugs and we do not know, and they are, they are specific, uh, they are probably less toxic, um, but there are many things still need to be uh, done. Uh, as the numbers increases, probably we will be know more about uh, efficacy and these things, yeah. Thank you. Ilya, I think there's one more question in the chat. Okay. okay uh, yes. How do you confirm the, uh, confirm the experimentally the accuracy of your simulations and models? Okay, so how do we, uh, okay, we, do not have wet lab results on these things, but we do uh, check the accuracy of our calculations many ways. For, first of all, when we do a molecular dynamics, especially if we are going to compare the like wild type and mutant systems, we do number of uh, simulations like repeat uh, them like three times uh, the, for the wild type, very long simulations and see if we are getting the same results. And sometimes you don't get the same results and then it means that something is wrong. And we uh, realize that the key thing is the force field. I mean, if you are using wrong force field parameter, you do not get consistent results. So you need to really uh, make sure that your force field parameter uh, fits to your protein. So this is one way of doing it. So repeating the MD simulations, long MD simulations for wild type two, two, three times and che checking if you are getting the same results. And if you are not getting same results, you need to go and look at force field and, or if we, it's still problem, it means that your protein is perhaps very loopy and that, that's the reason. So there's one way of uh, checking the accuracy, but for like uh, finding the allosteric sites. Okay, so we do many different calculations. Like we look at from the uh, pocket calculations, we do dynamic residue network analysis. These are all very different calculations. And uh, at the end, if you have something accurate, they uh, all give the similar results, okay, from many different ways. So that's, that's how we uh, do the, the um, uh, check the accuracy of our results. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you very much for checking if there are other, other questions in, in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, I, I don't think it is, is the case now. Um, so, um, so it is now my, my pleasant duty yeah, uh, to thank you very, very much for, um, for sharing your, your, your knowledge in this really exciting field uh, today with us. So thank you very much for, for your time and for the fantastic talk. And, uh, and I just would like to remember, remind everyone that uh, if people are interested, uh, we will have a, a, a short uh, virtual social event <laughs> in, in, in Kumo space just now. And Professor Bishop agreed to, 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 
to join us there for a, for a few minutes. So if you are interested to, in, to, to, to chat in a less formal environment, please uh, join us. It, uh, you just need to click uh, sign in and, uh, and it's very uncomplicated. And there are free drinks, so don't worry. So <laughs> So you, will, you, will be, you will be surprised. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Thank virtual you. drinks, but they are free. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I hope I see some of you uh, just now in uh, on, on the other platform. So thank you very okay. much. See, see you in a um, second. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. Have a good evening, everyone, and keep staying safe. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you, William. Bye. Yeah. Bye.